All right, so this is a PowerPoint about summary and analysis, which ultimately is about writing about literature. So one of the things that you really want to avoid when you're writing about literature is doing too much summary. And if you look at the holistic grading guide under rubrics for the class, you'll notice that when it comes time for portfolio, one of the criteria for a D paper or a two is that you use plot summary instead of analysis. So it's really important to distinguish the difference. Most of us know what a summary is. It tells what happens in a text, the sequence of events, or specific accounts of scenes or characters. It's like reporting, doing a book report in school. So here's a short summary of Cinderella, a story that most of us know. This is the Disney version. Once upon a time, there was a young girl whose father died, leaving her with her evil stepmother. She made her cook and clean until one day her fairy godmother came and turned her into a princess so she could go to the ball and meet the prince. At midnight, she turned back into a maid, and in her haste to leave the party, she lost her slipper. The prince was so enchanted with the girl that he did a search to find whoever the slipper would perfectly fit. So, when he discovered that Cinderella fit the slipper, they lived happily ever after. Now, there are more details in that, but that's a basic plot summary of the Disney Cinderella. Um, in my summary, there aren't any surprises for anyone who knows the story, right? I'm not making any arguments or claims. I'm simply telling you what it's about. And one of the words I use a lot, and you may have seen in some of your responses to the poetry, is, okay, you've told me what it's about, now tell me what it means. Um, the question is summary good material for a paper is in very small doses. So if my reader had not seen Cinderella, I don't know who that would be, or ever heard the story, I might want to do a little summary to tell them what happened, but I wouldn't want that to be the main action of my paper. And sometimes, you know, I'll say, assume your reader has already read it. Only do the summary you need to make your points. And this, a summary should be a very small percentage of the discussion of the text that you're doing throughout the paper. Okay, so first of all, you have to be able to know if I'm summarize, if you're summarizing. And this comes from the University of North Carolina Writing Center webpage, which is a good resource. And there's going to be a work cited at the end of this in case you want to go take a look at any of these resources. Um, as you read through your essay, ask yourself the following questions. Am I stating something that would be obvious to a reader or viewer? So again, if I had seen Cinderella and I said, Cinderella loses her glass slipper, that's summary. Am I simply describing what happens, where it happens, or to whom it happens? Does what I wrote seem to be irrelevant in a larger context, or do I lack stakes? And I really like that last question. And another way of phrasing it is, could I be wrong? And the answer is, if the answer is no, then that's a problem. It's probably a summary. When you write argument, you take risks. So you have to have stakes. You have to look at a piece of writing and say, I'm going to say something about this. And it might be kind of off the wall, but as long as you can support it with points from your, um, with points that are taken from the essay, because your support is always going to be the essay itself. Okay, so these are some questions to ask in order to identify summary, and it doesn't matter how well summary is written. You can have a really wonderful, well-written and eloquent summary, and it's still just that. It's still a summary. You could be the best book reporter in the world, and you could still not be doing analysis, still not making an argument about the text or giving an interpretation of the text. Here's some other warning signs for summary, and some of these are from myself, and some of these are from some of the other sources that you'll find at the end of the presentation. Using forms of the inactive verb to be or other weak verbs. So if you're saying something like, so-and-so is the main character in the story, that's summary. Unless you're saying something really off the wall, right, that some rabbit that appears on page 7 is actually the main character, and then maybe that is an argument, but it's unlikely. So watch out for saying is. Watch out also for saying about this movie or this book. Um, Tim O'Brien, The Things They Carry, is about war. Yes, it is. There's no arguing about that. That's not the only thing it's about. And maybe you could make other claims that would be more disputable. But you really need to be testing yourself at every step, especially as you're drafting your thesis statement. In a summary, the 
purpose is to inform. It often addresses the W's, who, what, when, where, why, and how. So why is it bad? If you're summarizing, you're not doing the important work of critically evaluating a text. We've all been summarizing texts our whole lives, right? Book reports in third grade, filling out forms about the plot of things. Um, we all know how to summarize. That's something that we've been learning our whole education. Learning how to do, you know, a concise, detailed summary is something that we might practice occasionally, but it's not really very often the meat of a college paper. You're not exercising the persuasive writing skills that you learned in English 101 either. So English 101 teaches you how to write a persuasive essay, a research paper, an argument paper, that sort of thing. And although analysis, literary analysis, might seem like a totally different type of writing, it actually utilizes those same persuasive skills, where you're trying to come up with paragraphs that have points and support. And a paragraph that has point and support is a paragraph that's arguing something. Your support here just ha happens to be um, material from the text, quotations from the poem. At this point in the semester, your support shouldn't be research, because that just complicates things. It's again not you interacting with the text and doing analysis, and that's really the first step. And then you can add in things like research. Um, after all, I can't argue that Cinderella is about a servant girl, but I can argue that, and here's my example, but I can argue that Cinderella is a feminist story about the oppression of women in a male-dominated society. You might disagree with me, but that means I'm making an argument, and that's what literary analysis is, an argument for a particular interpretation of a text. I always teach analysis as argument. You can do analysis without making an overall argument. You could analyze a certain symbol and maybe not argue about the whole text, but when you're writing a long paper, you're going to end up making an argument, not just analyzing little bits one piece at a time, like here are all the symbols and I've analyzed them. In a paper like the ones I'm asking you to produce, you then need to move to argument by summing up your findings in a thesis statement. It tells me what I'm supposed to take away and make my understanding of the entire text. So, you know, this might be my thesis. Cinderella is a feminist story about the oppression of women in a male-dominated society. Is that arguable? Absolutely. Okay, so if you can't do summary, what should I do, you do instead? Well, I've already been saying it over and over again, but analysis. And what analysis really means is to take something apart or break it down into its pieces and then examine the elements. So you could analyze symbols. It's very difficult to examine every element, so often you only look closely at one or two elements of a text like imagery or character or symbols or some of the things I went over in the little lecture before the poetry, um, my YouTube videos last week. And what I want to say about that is that analysis is the step before argument. You do end up putting this back together into an argument. So you may have practiced some analytical skills at some point also without ever turning them into argument. You may have practiced analyzing symbols in a poem. So you take every symbol in the poem or every piece of figurative language in the poem and analyze its meaning in the context of the poem. But now you have to put that together to make a statement about the entire poem. Sometimes I also refer to the process of examining all the different elements as close reading. And then here, however, in the end, you're going to put it all together again and make an argument about the text. And what I want to say as an example of that is say you go to see a movie, right? And say you go see some new movie that just came out. Like, now all I can think of is Shutter Island, even though it's not that new. But say you go to see Shutter Island and you hate it. You think it's the worst movie ever made. Or you love it. You think it's the best movie ever made. If you were going to write a review for, like, the New York Times about it, you couldn't just say, this is the worst movie ever made, and that would be the end of your review, right? You'd have to break it down into all its elements and talk about how they contributed to its overall badness. So, you know, what was wrong with the lighting? What was wrong with the acting? What was wrong with the script? What was wrong with all these different elements? And the same goes for a text, like a short story or a poem. 
The job of analysis is to take apart text and look at the significance of a particular part and how it affects the meaning of the whole. So that sort of, oops, sums up what I was saying before. This recording software makes it really grumpy to turn it. Um, is that once you've looked at the parts, and once you've figured out what this extremely important symbol seems to mean, or you've analyzed the character, then you've got to talk about how it affects the meaning of a whole. There are all different kinds of criticism that literary critics do, right? Because literary criticism is a field which a, a group of academics do when they publish papers. And if you've never read a paper of literary criticism, go on to your your library tab on your MyYC portal and look at the JSTOR database and look up a book that you've read. Not one we're working on, but you know, a classic maybe, Pride and Prejudice or something. And take a look at what the job is that liter literary critics are actually doing. Um, some of them called new critics are just doing close reading, so they never look at anything outside of the text. They don't see context as relevant to what the text means, because once the author writes the text and publishes it, and I said something to this effect talking about poetry when I asked you not to do research, once the author has put it out there in the world, it's an artifact that can be interpreted in whatever time and by whoever and the only support for any interpretation is internal, is in the text itself. But then we have a lot of different kinds of criticism, in particular political criticism and historical criticism, and we'll be working with those that came later that said, no, the context is important. So it's important to know what was going on in the world at the time the text was written. It might be important to know the author's biography. It might be important to learn about women's dress in the 1920s, whatever it is, but that that contributes. But still, the most important evidence is always in the text. And you end up making an argument about that text when you do analysis. So if I return to the example of Cinderella, maybe I want to narrow down my analysis by focusing in on characters in particular, and I want to look at the relationship between um, the heroine, Cinderella, and her evil stepmother, because I think that's a really important relationship at the center of the text. So I want to prove my thesis that I had before, that Cinderella is actually an anti-feminist text. And so I decide that Cinderella is representative of a weak-willed woman who goes from relying on her father to searching for another man to take care of her. Now you can see I'm doing new criticism here because I'm kind of ignoring the context of the time that Cinderella took place. She's incapable of seeing herself except through the eyes of men, and she engages in traditional female roles and behaviors, right? She's a maid, she's always cleaning the house, she's very feminine, all of these things. So that's what I've decided about Cinderella. On the other hand, we've got the evil stepmother, and she's the representative of a truly feminist character. She's not afraid to assert her dominance over the other women in her household. She assumes traditionally male role of head of household after her husband's death, and an apostrophe there in husbands, and she makes many executive decisions, so she's a powerful woman. Cinderella is a weak woman. Now that analysis may seem far-fetched, but it's making an arguable claim, which is important, right? You might disagree with me, that's good. I just have to be able to support it, right? I have to have those details, so I'd have to go back and watch the movie Cinderella, and I'd have to look for things that they said that would maybe support my analysis. But then there's always the other step, which is taking this analysis of each of the characters and asking the question, so what? So what if Cinderella's weak-willed in the, um, evil stepmother is actually the strong woman. So what? What have I learned that's going to make me view this text differently? So to turn these analytical statements into an argument, or a full literary analysis, I need to tell my reader how this part of the text that I've analyzed contributes to the meaning of the whole. And that's where I come up with my now even um, more detailed thesis, Cinderella is an anti-feminist text that rewards the traditionally and passively feminine behavior of the story's heroine while demonizing the usurpation of masculine power made by the evil stepmother. Okay, and I'm pretty well practiced at this, but this is the kind of thesis that you're looking for. Something that somebody could disagree with that articulates specifically the reading of the text that I've produced through my analysis of these particular characters. 
So the work of literary analysis is really to move from summary and description to analysis and then finally to argument. Um, there's another example here at this link and you can copy this link and go to it. Let's see. It doesn't like me. If I try to open it, I'm not sure what's going to happen, so bear with me here. So you don't necessarily have to have much summary. I'll just talk while we wait for this to open up, but you don't necessarily have to have much summary. You could just start with a little summary. Sometimes you want to tell what happened. So I might want to give an example of an interaction between the two characters, and I would be summarizing the text in that case. Um, but I would be using it as evidence. I'm not going to keep looking for it. It's mad at me now. Oh, it's so mad at me. <laughs> give me just a second. Here we've got it's finally opening up. If you've never heard of pi paragraphs before, and I know you have if you've been in my class, in every paragraph in an argument, there are three essential components, and you can use the acronym pi to remember them. And the first is that your paragraph needs to have a point. So I would say, Cinderella is weak-willed, and that should be argumentative also, something that someone could argue against. And then I would need support for that point, or illustrations, I, and so I would go to the text and give examples of her being weak-willed throughout the text. And then it needs explanation, which is me explaining in my own words how the illustrations that I've chosen are proving the point that I'm trying to make. So here's another example. Everyth I'm sorry, I'm really sorry that everything is so slow when I'm using Camtasia here but you are welcome to look at this on your own time and this is actually talking about um, a poem called The Flea by John Donne. So a summary tells what's happening. The speaker in The Flea compares having sex to the blood mingling bite of a flea in order to convince his beloved that sex would not be a big deal. Okay, so you actually have to do some close reading of the poem just to figure out what it's about which is something that we may have learned from reading poetry in the last unit. Description may take note of particular poetic devices, but makes no argumentative comment on those devices, like Dunn creates an extended metaphor by comparing the mingling of bodies and sex to the mingling of blood and a flea bite. He also uses religious imagery by comparing the flea to a temple in which the speaker and the beloved are cloistered. So what's missing here is an analysis of how these poetic devices function in the poem and why the author may have chosen to use them. And, you know, you're not looking for the magic key that gives you access to the author's thoughts. That doesn't exist, but you're trying to guess and then prove it. So really, you can look at this as being, my opinion is that this is what the author did, but then you just don't say that. You present it as an argument. So analysis acts, asks and answers how poetic devices function in the poem, what they signify or mean. By creating an extended metaphor in which the bite of a flea represents the act of sex, the speaker suggests to his beloved that sex is as insignificant, harmless, and sinless as the tiny flea bite. He also suggests that the holiness of their physical union is already contained in the flea, for he refers to it as a temple in which they are cloistered. Ah, so that would be good analysis about those of those particular images. What is the significance of those images? But now you have to say something about the whole poem, and that's what would become the thesis of this paper about the flea. And you can Google the flea and read it if you're interested in reading about this crazy flea poem. But to turn it into an argument, you use analytical points to make an arguable claim about the poem as a whole. In John Donne's The Flea, the speaker tries to convince his beloved to have sex with him by comparing the act of sex to the insignificant, sinless bite of a flea. But the speaker tries to have it both ways. At the same time that he uses the flea as a symbol of sinless insignificance, he also tries to convince his beloved that their union would be as grand and holy as the flea which he compares to a temple. And this is very common in a John Donne poem, to have these two um, divergent impulses. And a lot of these are very... Um, this is what a lot of Dunn's poetry is about, right? The the drive toward making something seem holy, but also natural. Particular sex. Alright, so that's just another example of that that you can go back to if you want. I want to resume my slideshow. Okay. 
So after that detour, here are some things to analyze. I don't know why I said some things instead of some things. I think I thought it was clever when I first made this PowerPoint, but um, this is from an, another thing that you'll find on the works cited page at the end. But you could analyze relationships, trends, or patterns, roles of people, places, objects, or situations, consequences or results of events, decisions and processes, causes and their effects, advantages and disadvantages, gains and losses, strength, strengths and weaknesses. You could use some of these questions to guide your analysis. So ask yourself, why is that a significant part of the text? So when you're reading, this is what I recommend. When something seems weird or off or divergent, whatever, I talked about this in poetry, you know, when the, when the rhyme is off or the meter is off, but even when an image seems a little bit off, if it seems contradictory, what we call that is cognitive dissonance, and that means that it just doesn't seem right. And you want to mark that because that might be a particularly important part of the text. What particular meaning does it have for me? So this is a good place to start. That's why we started there with our first essay. What particular meaning does it have for me? And then what larger issue does this scene or paragraph relate to that interests me? Why does a certain part of a text disturb me or why am I attracted to it? So these questions are questions that are guided by what we call critical inquiry, which is locating moments of cognitive dissonance and exploring them, something we've been doing all semester with, you know, I talked about it in the poetry unit, like I said. I don't think I've used that terminology. But critical inquiry means that when you're asking why of the text, that's a good place to start. It's best to start an analysis from a place where you genuinely feel confused by the text. Because if you feel like you already know the answer, you're probably just telling us what it's about. What it means you need to actually do some investigation and inquiry of your own. Summary is an observation where analysis is an inference. Um, in class, I often do a exercise where you make a tea table. We all know what a tea table looks like. It looks like a tea. And on one side, I write observations. And on the other side, I write inferences. So observations, if we were going to go out and make an observation of a preschool class, you would sit there and write down the things you observed. It's summarizing, right? I saw this, I saw this, I saw this. You can do the same thing with a text. Um, Tim O'Brien is the main character in his own story, or at least the main character is named Tim O'Brien. Tim O'Brien is at first reluctant to go to war and tries to run away to Canada. Tim O'Brien seems to have made good, a close friendship with Rat Kylie, and many of his stories focus on Rat Kylie. These are just observations. The analysis part is making inferences about this observation. So you ask why. Why does Tim O'Brien make his main character called Tim O'Brien? The answer to that is your inference. Um, if you think of it this way, eventually those observations become the evidence in the form of quote summaries and paraphrases. However, you need inferences about those observations to eventually formulate an argument. You could write a whole paper about why Tim O'Brien's main character is named Tim O'Brien. And you could relate it to all of the many quotes about truth and fiction in those stories, right? Truth versus fiction or how to tell a true war story are themes in both Hughes and um, O'Brien. Hint, hint. It's not the only shared theme, but you could go through and look. How do these authors differ? You want to start with a question that guides your inquiry. Your thesis statement isn't a question in the end. It's the answer to the question that you began your inquiry with. Um, this is just a chart, and this is from someone I used to work with named Amanda Brabel at um, U of A, who made this little chart to make stronger thesis statements. And if you're using, mostly if you're using a weak verb, and that was one of the things we talked about before. And this is not a literary analysis thesis, obviously, but her example is if you have a thesis, the economic situation is bad. You work on being more specific, the tax policies of the current administration, and work on an active verb, threaten to reduce the tax burden on the middle class, and an assertive predicate by sacrificing education and health care programs for everyone. Okay, and of course you could go the other way to the political spectrum, um, but that's not what's at stake here really. It's about making things more specific and more active 
So if I had my example I used before, Shutter Island is bad, here's where I would start being more specific in there. The over-the-top acting in Shutter Island threatens to um, threatens to make the, sto the already unbelievable story even more unbelievable by making it obvious that the film is constructed. That's a lovely thesis off the top of my head, but you, you know, you get the idea. It's all about being more specific and more active. Oops. No. Okay, so these are all about formulating body paragraphs in a literary analysis. Always analyze rather than summarize. Include one claim at the beginning of every paragraph. So a claim is the main point of your paragraph, and it functions like a thesis for the paragraph by telling what your reader what the primary point of the present paragraph is. Claims are points, and this is the pie deal I was talking about while we were waiting for that PDF to come up. Um, claims or points always have a relationship to your thesis. The thesis explains generally what the main point of your paper is. Each claim covers an aspect of the paper the thesis encompasses, right? So if you're saying Shutter Island is bad, but you've made it much more eloquent, and you think it's bad because of bad acting, um, bad writing, and I actually really like Shutter Island, by the way, so this is me going in the opposite direction. And um, the setting was all too dark or something. Then you might have a body paragraph about each, each of those things, and you have a point to make about it that leads back to your thesis. One claim should lead logically to the next, each, um, oops, I should say which, I think, which a reiteration of the initial claim in the final sentence of your paragraph may provide. You must have explanation relating your claim to your evidence. Evidence found in your observations will support the idea you're trying to prove or argue, but using it requires your own words to help explain the connection between it and the claim. This should be analytical. You should not just summarize what you just quoted. You must explain why it's significant to your overall argument, okay? So if you have a quote from Tim O'Brien, hold on one second. I'm going to take a look at my Tim O'Brien here to, to help you. We'll start with... Um, if I want to look at how to tell a true war story, of course I pick up the copy that I don't have any notes in. <laughs> I am looking at the top of page, or the middle of page 68, right after the break, and O'Brien says, a true war story is never moral. It does not instruct, nor encourage virtue, nor suggest models of proper human behavior, nor restrain men from doing the things men have always done. If a story seems moral, do not believe it. If at the end of a war story you feel uplifted, or if you feel that some small bit of rectitude has been salvaged from the larger waste, then you have been made the victim of a very old and terrible lie. Okay, so if, if I wanted to quote that, because I thought that that seemed an important quote and I was talking about truth or something was my the theme of my paper, um... I wouldn't then just want to analyze it by saying, you know, Tim O'Brien says that war stories aren't moral, and that's my analysis. First of all, your analysis should always be as long as the quote, at least, and it should go beyond the summary. So I might say that in this passage, like many others in the book, O'Brien is questioning the dichotomy between truth and fiction, and also questioning the purpose of stories in general. We seem to think that s stories always require a moral, and he's suggesting that truth and morals might be the real dichotomy, or something like that. So, um, it's analytical. It's not summary. Okay, so, you know, I always put this on the end because... Sometimes when you're doing literary analysis, you're thinking, how does this apply to what I'm eventually going to do? Why should I care whether or not I'm doing analysis and not just summarizing? Like, as long as it's well-written summary, what's wrong with it? And here's my answer. And this first quote here is from an essay that I, call, I sometimes assign from a guy named Greg Smith, and it's called It's Just a Movie. 
and he says the basic faith underlying education is that an examined life is better richer and fuller than an unexamined life how do we really know that self-examination is better than the bliss of simple ignorance like most statements of faith there is no way to prove it but by being in a college classroom you have allied yourself with those of us who believe that if you do not examine the forces in your life you will become subject to them and this is you know learning how to do analysis is sort of flexing your analytical muscles I might say something like this on the next slide so I'll check um, it might seem that it's a skill that's relatively inapplicable in real life however it's not really the case the careful logic involved in constructing a thoughtful analysis is one of the skills that English majors gain that make them fit for careers in law um, a lot of applicants to law school are English majors forming a thoughtful argument based on evidence is something that we do every day for all sorts of reasons I also tend to believe that it is important to question the things that we consume learning to look at a television show or a magazine advertisement critically allows you to be more critical in all aspects of your life which I tend to think is a good thing although you may disagree so you know that first quote is talking about the purpose one of the purposes of education is to look at things critically to start questioning our surroundings and whether or not you end up circling back to the same conclusions you originally made at least you went through a process of critical inquiry and examination or critical thinking um, and you can do that with any text and once you start to get really good at it with literary texts you know texts that sort of invite you to look at them closely like Tim O'Brien he says a lot of things that seem important but then maybe you start looking at things that seem less important you start looking at them critically and thinking things like why do so many people watch Jersey Shore or why do advertisers so often use naked women to sell their products and what is the effect on society of that and you may or may not enjoy that process but I think it's an important process you know how many of you have seen Wally and seen all everybody hooked up to their TV with their sodas you know this is the the idea that we, we teach ourselves to think um, in order to avoid being unconscious consumers in any way um, even you know like I said even if that doesn't change your politics or your thoughts or your beliefs because that's not the point the point is to just have examined to have looked at something closely just like that's the goal and to look at things closely in most of your classes not just English okay so how do I get an A paper here's some more practical question that was the more philosophical portion of why we do analysis but this is the practical moment how do I get an A the word I tend to associate with an A paper is sophisticated the word that we actually use on the holistic grading guide is excellent um, for a six or very good for a five which are both A papers um, sophisticated to me means that I can really see your process of critical thinking and critical inquiry happening as you're writing your paper I see that you've really engaged with the text that you didn't take the task lightly it's a difficult thing to put your finger on and quantify but it is definitely analytical and usually it surprises me at least in one way and that doesn't mean that I've never ever thought the thing that you thought about the text before but that you've put it together really eloquently and made a really unique claim about the text you're much more likely to receive a five or a six on an essay if you tell me something I didn't already know. If I learn from your literary analysis essay, you've done a great job. Of course, also to get an A, you need to be honest and practice academic integrity. And then you need to write well. Proper grammar, mechanics, formatting, including MLA citation, excellent organization, flow, all of that stuff that you've been learning in your time as a composition student analysis is just you know the sort of deeper level or higher level thinking that you're doing as you do analysis is like the icing on the cake of all the good writing skills that you've already learned so um, 
I suggest narrowing your focus, and this is getting more specifically into thinking about the paper that you're about to write, because I've asked you to compare O'Brien and Hughes, and you could compare all of O'Brien to all of Hughes, but that would be quite a task, right? And next we're going to read a novel, we're going to read Margaret Atwood, The Handmaid's Tale, and then you're going to um, look at that. And it's very difficult to do that if you haven't um, narrowed. You know, and I, I suggest if something interests you, if something catches your attention as you're reading the first story, you know, obviously because I keep bringing it up, what really catches my attention and my focus in Tim O'Brien is all the stuff he says about truth and fiction. And um, so when I was reading this book for the first time, I spent a lot of time underlining every thing I found about truth and fiction that caught my attention really fast. In The Handmaid's Tale... I'm very interested in when of Fred, the main character in that novel, thinks about her body. So I, um, I underline stuff about that a lot in that novel. I also stuff about the color red and stuff referring to the comparison with communism that's being made in that novel. So I tend to underline stuff that sticks out to me from the very beginning. I really recommend that to you. You know, selling back paperbacks, you can do it. You're not going to get a ton of money. And if it helps you get a better grade in the class, it's maybe worth sacrificing that. I don't even have any idea how much you would get back, like five bucks, um, to go ahead and write in your books. And actually, usually, there are places that will still buy them back even after you've written in them. And then maybe somebody else gets to learn from your wonderful underlines. So, to perform an analysis, especially on a longer text, like I said, it, it's better to focus on a particular aspect. I'm totally missing a word in that first part, but sometimes it's easier to perform an analysis if you focus on a particular aspect of that text. There are many possibilities for narrowing a focus. You could focus on a character, a theme, image, symbol, metaphor, language. I've really asked you to focus on a theme in Hughes and O'Brien, and they, they share more themes than just war. You know, I was talking about one of them today, but there are themes about relationships. You could write about love in those texts. You could write about fear or freedom. There's lots of different things that are being addressed in those texts. But I would like you to choose one of those themes, and then maybe some of these other things like character or, uh, character or, character or metaphors or language will come into play. But start by focusing on a theme. One of the easier ways to focus is by narrowing your analysis down to a character or the relationship between two characters. This is definitely possible in these texts as well, comparing one of the characters giving a monologue in Hughes to one of the characters that appears in Tim O'Brien's book, not necessarily Tim O'Brien. Um, one of the most, I think, fascinating characters and the things they carried is, I think it's Marianne from The Sweetheart of the Satra Bong and that is a really fascinating character that might be able to be compared to some of the characters portrayed in Tim O'Brien. Okay. Symbols or figures. We talked about these things. And here's my work cited in case you want to look at oops, any of this later. Um, analysis versus summary is available on the web. Oops. Analysis versus summary is available on the web at Florida International University. This is available in the student's guide from the U of A, and if you're interested in seeing this, I can forward you a copy. This is gratisec.com. This is a teaching essay that I also have and would be happy to share with you if you're interested, or the UNC Writing Center. So hopefully you got some useful resources and some useful ways to think about the reasons that we do analysis. Um, and how to approach it. Please let me know if you have any questions and shoot me an email. And good luck as you start to work on your essay number two.